when I'm in the studio making work, the big priority is for me to surprise myself. What I'm looking for is a moment of awe in finding beauty. On July 2nd, I got to talk to artist Carson Fox as her show was being installed at Philadelphia's Stanek Gallery. I found her to be a scintillating raconteur. I'm Carson Fox. I grew up in the South. I couldn't wait to leave. <laughs> Richmond had that kind of southern sluggishness where you just were desperate for something to happen. The constant sound of cicadas going on and on and on in the trees. I remember just laying in the grass watching ants thinking, oh my god, something's got to happen, right? Yes, something did happen for this fierce girl trapped in a southern gothic novel. She escaped north and became nationally known for her prints, installations, and sculptural work in an unusual medium. In recent years, I've worked exclusively with brightly hued resin, creating sculptures and installations. Resin is a really exciting material to use because it's liquid. There's an A part and a B part. When you mix them together, then the chemical reaction starts where it starts to harden. In that process, you can mix in all kinds of different things, dry pigments that become suspended. You could put glitter, you could put sand, you could put anything you want and it dyes to create different colors. Resin is toxic. I really protect myself when I'm in the studio. I have an exhaust fan. I wear gloves, a big smock. I feel pretty safe. When I pick up my son from school, I still have the elastic marks from the mask pressed into my skin. <laughs> but better that than not being around to see him graduate from high school. For much of her career, Carson has made objects that look like real things. Where I had a very specific thing that I wanted to make, I would always make a mold, a rubber mold. If you pour it into a mold, you can brush the surface with pigments and the resin will just capture it and it becomes permanent It's part of the resin now. And that's one of the things I really love about the process. The show that I'm having at Stanek now is really a departure. The first showing of sculptures that are purely abstract. What I've been doing lately is pouring the resin into plastic bags and then as it sets up, manipulating it, moving it around so that it creates these other shapes. Inevitably, the shape needs to be modified. I can sand it, I can use a chisel and carve away big sections. And then I can reapply more resin on top so that I have all of these different layers. You can also coat resin over pre-existing forms that you've made. Sometimes I'll build it out of chunks of insulation foam, put resin all over it, inevitably don't like something. So it's this process of going back and forth, fixing, correcting, destroying. When I'm putting two pieces together, if it's something that's fairly lightweight, the resin will bond to itself and that can act as the glue that holds things together. But if it's something that's going to be heavy, the parts are attached simply by drilling holes in and then putting metal rods through them so that they hold on. This business of abstraction is kind of interesting. You look at the sidewalk, a broken up sidewalk, and there it is. You can find an example or something similar in nature of anything that you might call abstract. I always think that's kind of a funny way of thinking. What I'm looking for now are these peripheral influences, the stains on sidewalks and falling down buildings and crumbling masses. In addition to abstract concerns of color, shape, texture, and form, Carson has always been drawn to history and narrative. Installations begin with a specific idea and are typically composed of many small pieces that comprise the whole. For example, the work Gold Rush features an expanse of gold rocks suspended mid-air. The cloud of floating rocks represents the intoxication of belief before true circumstances unfurl and specifically refers to the great American gold rush of the mid-1800s that drew thousands westward. 
Their dreams drove them across hundreds of miles of terrain, rife with hardship, only to eventually find their fantasies would most likely never be fulfilled. The faux rocks in Gold Rush are modeled after pyrite, called fool's gold, and represent a lie twice removed. The objects are made of resin to represent rocks that were commonly mistaken for gold. Sometimes the dream is the best part of an adventure. In a striking series of prints, Carson shows how time corrodes historical memory. There's a particular period between 1830 and 1890 when engravings were being made. They're highly realistic, but if you look at them close up, it's all just this pattern of incredibly beautiful abstract marks coming together to make something that is instantly recognizable. So I was really fascinated with that. I was also fascinated with the fact that these artists who spent their whole lives perfecting this technique, the heyday was only probably about 50 years, that went away fairly quickly. I started collecting portraits from that period of time. To have an engraved portrait of you made, you had to have been really important. But here are these people who are so well known in their day, and now they're totally forgotten, just like the printmakers. History has moved on, and we would never recognize these people. That made me think about time, how we just disappear. I took those images, scanned them, fixed any flaws in the original prints. I made them much larger, I made them high contrast, and I printed them digitally. And then I took a Japanese hole punch. It's used in book binding mostly, but you can put different tips on it. And so I started creating these patterns that eroded the image itself to see how much I could take away and yet still have it be recognizable. That was symbolic of how incomplete history is and as time goes on, how we remember often very cursory things about a person and how it's just being undone by time. All the holes that are in the surface of the paper, I think of as me stamping my moment in time into the paper itself. So it's this communication with the person in the portrait, the maker of the portrait, and myself, and acknowledging that we're all just here for a little bit, and then we're going to be erased. Personal history has also played a huge role in Carson's career. At the age of five, Carson knew she would become an artist. Her dad was an art history professor at Virginia Commonwealth University. It was a sort of strange upbringing. My father was a difficult person who had some kind of significant mental illness. And a lot of my early work is about that. I'd be attracted to something and wouldn't quite know why, and trusted that it was important and pursued it. And then in the making, I'd realize, oh, there's this story behind this. Once, without knowing why, she became obsessed with reproducing a wrought iron fireplace log. We lived in this little Victorian house. Every room had a little tiny coal fireplace, but you could burn wood in it too. And so my dad decided that we couldn't afford to heat the house anymore. We had this old beat up Cadillac we had inherited from my grandmother. We cut down trees, cut them up, put them in the back of the Cadillac. <laughs> I brought it home, dragged them all into the yard, and there was this log pile that sat in the back of the yard. Because my dad could think up these tasks, but not complete them. The, the log pile just sat there for the rest of my living in that house. And every time I would look at it, it would just be this reminder of the dysfunction and unhappiness that I was growing up with. To remake it was this gesture to reshape the memory so that I could lay claim to it as something that I possessed and not something that possessed me. In 2001, my mother-in-law, who I loved, and my mother and my father all died in quick succession. I started looking at roadside memorials that people would construct, and I was so moved by them. I really thought about how people have this creative need to construct something in the wake of a great loss like that. And that's when I started making things with flowers, thinking about flowers as something to go into memorials.
Another story also helps explain Carson's obsession with flowers. One of her happiest memories of growing up was creating and tending a flower garden with her mother. My mother had divorced my father, remarried this awful guy. When my mother died, he changed the locks on the house that I grew up in. I never got back into it again. But I looked over the fence and he had poured concrete all over the garden. I kept having these dreams about all the flowers trying to come up through the cement and not being able to come up. And so I made a bunch of flowers. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in a lot of ways, the art making has been this sort of therapy for me. The year after she graduated high school, she worked multiple jobs to get money to pay for art school. 1987, I was 19, came to Philadelphia and went to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. 91, got a Crescent traveling scholarship. I traveled in Europe for three months and then came back for another year. I really loved their program. I was a printmaking major and I thought that's what I'd do for the rest of my life. When I finished at the Academy, I started working there as the print shop manager. And then within a year or so, I started teaching there. I realized that I loved teaching and that if I was going to continue teaching that I needed to have a master's degree. I wanted to go to a graduate school that was completely different from the academy because the academy it's very much about being able to make things well and that was something I I'd still benefit from tremendously. But what was missing for me was this idea of content. I was making these things and at a certain point why am I making them? What do they mean? I also wanted to go to a school where I could see women as big role models for me. Because when I went to the academy, I had maybe three female instructors. It wasn't enough. I felt like I was treated often by some of the older male professors, and you can edit this out if you want to. <laughs> but I was treated like some nice girl that was going to get married, and why invest any time with her? She told me about one teacher who will remain nameless. He spoke to all of the boys in the class, but he didn't talk to me once, and he gave me a C. And I remember being so infuriated because I worked harder than anybody in that class. He had an idea of who I was, and that was it. So I wanted to go somewhere where I could see some strong women. I settled on Rutgers, which had a feminist sort of program, and some really interesting women who taught there, like Martha Rossler and Judy Brodsky and Lynn Allen, really powerful women who also somehow made families work and did everything. And that was something I didn't have an example of before. Also, coming from the South as I did, I was taught that I shouldn't make trouble, I shouldn't say what I meant. There was this other sort of secret language that women participated in so that they were perceived as being nice. And I was pretty tired <laughs> of that. I don't want to be nice, and I felt at home. The program did not have separate departments. I was encouraged to do whatever I wanted to do. Yeah, I will say it was an incredibly difficult period of time. Uh, yeah, I was thoroughly miserable <laughs> in graduate school because I got some, some critiques that I, I thought I might vomit in the middle of the critique because they were just so vicious. I got one from Joan Semmel, who's a figurative painter. She's terrific. She's such a kick-ass lady. But at the time, she just laid me out about using the female figure the way I did because I hadn't really thought about it. Nice naked ladies, oh, everybody likes them, right? <laughs> and that's what I'd done at the Academy. And she really opened my eyes to thinking about it a lot more thoughtfully. So I got to this point of where I felt beaten down. At a certain point I thought, okay, I'm gonna regroup. What do I really wanna do? okay, I'm just going to use materials that I absolutely love. So I started making all kinds of different things. I made this series of tiaras out of beads and that I coated with copper and then put a patina on. She also embedded nails inside so that wearing the tiara would be quite painful, showing that being a nice girl 
was not without its costs. And I made a lot of things that just crossed over into sculpture. And I realized how similar sculpture was, at least to me, to printmaking. In the process, even in making multiples. And I was really comfortable with it right away. I've always continued making prints, but sculpture has really dominated things since I finished graduate school in 1999. I got married in graduate school. Are you a pretty nice husband? In the I think days? so. I tried to be most, most of the time. <laughs> We moved to Trenton, New Jersey. Which was situated between her adjunct teaching gigs at NYU, Rutgers, and PAFA. She had a huge studio. I had this period of time where I was able to make a lot of fairly large sculptures in this space. At a certain point, I guess I was around 35, woke up one morning and thought, hey, I don't have any health care. <laughs> I might want to have a baby. I need to maybe get a full-time job. Were you a cute baby? Yeah, yeah, it was very cute. <laughs> and I eventually landed at Adelphi University, which is in Long Island. And so we moved to New York, into this studio that was so small. How was I going to make anything in this small space? And my solution was to make small things that I could then make into a larger whole. I could make things in parts, assemble them in all sorts of different configurations. And that's when I started making installations in earnest. Whether they are installations or sculptures or prints, whether their forms are representational or abstract, Carson Fox's artworks are always thoughtful and beautifully made. Viewers who spend time with them are richly rewarded. Somewhere in the back of your mind, you have this desire to be seen and to be understood. We're desperate to communicate with one another, desperate to connect with other people. When I show my work, and somebody tells me it reminded them of something in their lives, that there was a communication between the object and themselves. That's when I think something's successful. As her foray into abstraction confirms, Carson is not one of those artists who get their single big idea when young and never deviate from it for the rest of their careers. Her path takes courage. As things started to become less recognizable as anything but what they were, I was really uncomfortable with that. It made me really nervous. I'm 50 years old, I've built a whole career on having this kind of story to back up the things that I make, and then that was evaporating. But I've learned that I've got to just trust my instincts. I said to myself, I, yeah, stop belly aching <laughs> about this and just move forward and see where it takes you. 